The ocean covers 70% of the globe. It gives us oxygen and food and millions of jobs. It brings joy and shapes our climate and weather. The ocean is life and it belongs to everyone. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is the world's independent leader in ocean discovery, exploration, and education, working to understand and sustain one of humanity's most precious common resources. Join us today for our ocean, our planet, and our future. Welcome to the Ocean Encounters virtual series from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI as we like to call it for short. Tonight's presentation is Sharks, New Insights into an Iconic Ocean Predator. My name is Veronique LaCapra and I'll be your host for this evening. Sharks are one of the most iconic and feared groups of animals in the ocean. Like other apex predators, they play a crucial role in the ecosystem they call home. Joining us to talk all things shark are shark biologist Greg Skomel from the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries and ocean ecologist Simon Thorold from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. You'll be hearing from each of them shortly. But first, I'd like to take a minute to get a sense of where people are tuning in from today. If you've joined us on Zoom, you should see a pop-up poll on your screen in a second or two um, asking you where you're from. Um, Hui is on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, so I'm guessing quite a few people will be from the northeastern U.S., but if you're from somewhere else, please let us know. The poll choices don't cover everywhere, but please pick the one that's closest to where you are. While the poll's running, let's take care of a little housekeeping. If you're watching us on Zoom, you'll be able to ask questions by clicking on the Q&A button on your screen and typing your question in the window that appears. So you may be more familiar with the chat function in Zoom, but this is the Q&A button. So please use that. We often get hundreds of questions. So if we don't get to yours while we're live, our goal will be to post answers to as many questions as we can following the program. You can ask questions anytime, starting now, and I'll start the live Q&A with Simon and Greg after they have both presented. I also wanna let you know that we are recording this event um, and that recording will be mail, made available on the hui.edu website. And looks like we've got some poll results. So as expected, lots of folks joining us from the Northeast, um, but quite a few from the Southeast and on the West Coast as well. And um, even we've got 8% of folks joining us from outside the US, which is terrific. So welcome everybody. Um, and also, I wanted to let you know that we had almost 1,900 people register for this event, so you are in very good company. Welcome to everybody. All right, let's get started with the main event. First, thank you to Greg and Simon for joining us this evening to tell us about sharks, their behavior, and their role in a healthy ocean. And thank you also to everyone who tuned in tonight. Let's start with Greg. As I mentioned, Greg Skomel is a fisheries biologist for the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. He has been studying sharks for more than 35 years. Much of his work has been in New England, but he has also tagged sharks all over the world, from the Arctic Circle to the Caribbean. His work has been featured in several television documentaries, including ones on the Discovery Channel and National Geographic. Greg loves to swim with sharks, and he's an avid scuba diver and underwater photographer. Tonight, he will talk about great white sharks, a species he fell in love with because of the movie Jaws. Greg, thank you for being here. Veronique, thank you. I wanna thank uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution for inviting me and all you folks for showing up. Welcome to my home. Uh, I know these are tough times, but it's always a pleasure when I get a chance to talk about sharks, and this is probably the biggest talk I've given in a very long time with over uh, a thousand people watching. Uh, tonight I'm gonna to talk about, uh, very briefly, because we don't have a lot of time, but some of the research we're doing, and I've titled it Living with White Sharks because that's the phenomenon that's happening right now off the Northeastern US. And it's something that we need to get accustomed to. And, and I wanna give you a sense of the kinds of research we're doing uh, to make living with white sharks easier, I think, for all of us. 
So the white shark is an iconic species. And for those of us who love sharks, we certainly love this particular species. Of course, it is also a dangerous species on a relative scale compared to others, and certainly has been implicated in negative interactions and attacks on people. Um, but it is a species that's been studied all over the world. It is a shark that inhabits all the world's oceans, and a lot of intensive research has gone on in the Pacific and Indian Oceans on this species. But here in the Atlantic, we're only beginning to scratch the surface. And that's because the, the white shark is, is such a fascinating animal, but we've never really had good predictable access to this species in the Atlantic until now. And the reason is because we have a changing environment here in, in, uh, in New England and we're restoring, for the most part, seal populations. The white shark is a really fascinating animal because it, as it gets bigger, it gets larger, it gets stronger, it's able to attack and kill bigger prey. And those prey include sea lions and seals and a group of animals we call pinnipeds, as well as dolphins, porpoises, and they love to scavenge whale carcasses. So anywhere you get a great abundance of seals and sea lions that overlaps with the distribution of the white shark, you get greater numbers of white sharks. This is part of a natural ecosystem. So here in New England, we drove our seal populations to the brink of extinction. And it wasn't until 1972 that we realized that and we passed the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And with the protection of almost 50 years, seals are responding to that. So it's somewhat of a conservation success story. And when you've got this much potential prey in the area, you've got the predator that's going to show up and that's the white sharks. And it really does point to the, the crucial role that sharks play in keeping the balance in the marine ecosystem. You know, large numbers of seals means white sharks are going to show up to try to control that seal population. But the hunting that's going on, I'm going to be very specific to Cape Cod right now, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, which isn't too far from my home. And I know a lot of you who are watching from the Northeast know exactly where that is. You know, white sharks are hunting the, the great abundance of seals that occurs along the coastline of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And this hunting strategy is happening in really shallow water like you see in this particular photograph. But we also know that there's a lot of other things happening in shallow waters of Cape Cod. And that is we've got a lot of recreational activities. And so you've got this predator-prey relationship, which is a natural relationship happening in our shallow coastal waters right off of Cape Cod, and then you've got people who are coming out to use, as they have for many, many years, and enjoy the waters in these shallow areas, whether it be surfing or boogie boarding. And that, of course, could lead to the potential for negative interactions. And certainly along the coastline of Massachusetts, which had not seen a fatal attack since 1936, we've seen an uptick in recent years. Now, the probability of a shark attack, and we need to keep this in mind, is extremely low. But nonetheless, we have seen an, up, an uptick in recent years of negative interactions between sharks and people. And in fact, in 2018, uh, two individuals are att were attacked and one attack was fatal, unfortunately. So from a scientific point of view, I want to now generate as much information as I possibly can about this species that might be helpful to enhance public safety. And so what we're doing is intensive, intensifying our tagging efforts using a variety of technologies. We want to understand, better understand, this predator-prey relationship that plays out every day in the coastal waters of Massachusetts between sharks and their natural prey seals. We believe that if we can understand what's going on, when, where, and how sharks are attacking seals, we'll be able to generate valuable information and find patterns in, in their behavior that can tell us uh, what these sharks are doing. So we've been tagging, we've now tagged over 200 white sharks using acoustic technology. And what you see in this graphic, each one of these yellow dots represents an acoustic receiver that we've put around Cape Cod. Anytime one of our tagged sharks swims within the range of one of those receivers, generally a couple of hundred yards, the receiver detects who that shark is. And that basically tells us when and where the sharks are spending their time. When do they show up? Where do they spend their time? And when do they leave? They give us a really nice look at the fine scale local movements of these animals. 
Now we've used a variety of other kinds of tags as well um, to show broad scale movements. Tonight, I'm gonna look specifically at the data from these acoustic tags. When you look at this animation, all the little white dots re represent our acoustic receivers. If you look at the upper left-hand corner, you'll also see the date. This is the summer of 2019. And as each one of these acoustic receivers bubbles up and gets bigger and bigger, it represents more white sharks. So here we see not only the seasonality of the sharks arriving in Massachusetts and Cape Cod, but where they're spending their time. You can see how they move into Cape Cod Bay, the central portion. You can also see how they're even visiting some of the towns along the, the, the south shore of Massachusetts from Boston to Cape Cod. But the bulk of these bubbles are really forming on the outer Cape, and that's, of course, where all the seals are. And as we get into November, which is where the graphic is right now, you could also see that the, the sharks are fading away and they're leaving. The sharks are moving out of these waters as things cool down. So basically what we're seeing is a very, very distinct seasonality to these sharks uh, on Cape Cod, not only when they arrive, where they spend their time, but when they leave. And that's really important information. Now, the next question for us is when they're in these areas, how do they hunt their prey? And so we're using a very, very new technology to do that. This graphic is a screen grab from a video that we shot showing one of our newer technologies. What you see inserted at the base of the dorsal fin is one of our standard acoustic tags. But what it's showing is actually a very sophisticated camera system that has a lot of different sensors built into it. And what those sensors do is they detect the fine scale movements of the shark, measures a dozen different parameters 20 times per second to tell me how that shark is swimming in the water column. And here's an example of video footage that we got from one of the sharks we tagged this past summer. We're basically riding along the back of one of these white sharks. And the data you see on the left side of the screen shows you the depth, the temperature, whether that shark is accelerating or not, whether it's slowing down. So we're looking at very, very distinctive behaviors coming from the tag and correlating that with some of our visuals. And as this video starts to play out right about here, you see the shark accelerate. That's a peak in acceleration that you see on the left-hand side of the screen. And what this allows us to do is to track the very, very fine scale movements so they can see how these sharks are behaving, get a sense of when they're cruising along and doing nothing, or maybe resting, or even accelerating to feed on seals. So this graphic, what we're doing is taking those data sets and recreating the three-dimensional movements of the sharks as they go into shallow water. And you'll see how we see this shark absolutely accelerate toward these, these, these animated seals, swing and a miss, but nonetheless make a, a, an attempt. And all that is captured by our data set. So now we'll be able to tell when are the sharks accelerating, when are they going to feed. We can look at time of day, we can look at other environmental features, like tide and currents and, uh, and whether or not this is happening day or night and start to answer those questions as to when, where, and how sharks are hunting their prey. And once we have a very predictable pattern, we'll be able to forecast those areas that people should avoid because this predator-prey relationship is happening. Let's remember, this is a natural ecosystem functioning properly. Numbers of seals being consumed by sharks, the top predator taking out the meso predator. And what we want is we want to preserve this while at the same time cohabitating with this species. So I ask you all to stay tuned because we're deploying these technologies over the course of the next several months. And we're going to start generating these data and hopefully I'll be able to share them all with you again. So thank you for coming out this night and spending some time with me. I'm going to stick around for long enough to, to see my good friend Simon speak and about some of the projects that he's working on and then uh, answer all your questions. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Greg. That is such a cool 3D animation of the shark hunting the seals. I love that. Uh, before I introduce a little bit about Simon, I'd like to test all of your knowledge about great white sharks with another online poll. So we should see that come up. Here it is. 
Um, our question for you is, how long can great white sharks live? How long can great white sharks live? Give it a minute here for the results to come in. And here we go, here are our results. Uh, most of you picked the correct answer. 42% of you said more than 70 years, and that is the correct answer. Um, so basically sharks live about as long as people, which is pretty amazing. Now let's hear from our second guest tonight, Simon Thorold. Simon has worked as an ocean ecologist at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution for almost 20 years. He uses techniques that span chemistry, genetics, and satellite tagging to study the ecology of a wide variety of ocean fishes, including sharks and rays. Simon grew up in New Zealand, and he was inspired by the TV show, Under The Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau, that showed Sunday evenings on the country's only television channel. He has logged thousands of hours of scuba diving on coral reefs in the Caribbean, the Red Sea, and the Indo-Pacific Ocean, and has worked with conservation organizations and governments to promote the protection and sustainable use of life in the ocean. Simon, thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks, Veronique. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, and it's always, it's always fun to hear Greg talk and see the latest that he's doing too. Um, we are gonna talk um, more about sharks. Um, we're gonna stay reasonably local, um, but, but as much as I love um, white sharks, I, I think actually my favorite shark is this guy. Um, this is a short fin mako shark, and makos are really interesting to us because they're a, a, a real model species for true pelagic sharks. This video was shot by a friend and colleague, Eric Savitsky from Nantucket, um, and what it, sh it just shows you how um, amazing these sharks are in the open water, in their, in their natural habitat. Um, they, they really are quite beautiful. Um, and they also do some really amazing things that we're only just really learning about. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, but yeah, mako sharks, if, you, if you're looking for a favorite shark, you could do a lot worse than, than picking mako sharks. Um, and uh, we're gonna, we're gonna um, increase the spatial scale a little bit from what Greg was talking about. So his tags are, um, are used to look at fine scale movements. We were interested in larger scale movements of makos. Um, and in this photo, uh, in this image here, is actually a, the person who's done a lot of the work that I'm gonna talk about, Cameron Braun, um, who is at the University of Washington now, but did his PhD in the, joint, in the MIT Huey Joint Program. Um, and that's his, uh, that's his dad behind him, who um, is obviously very keen on fishing as well. Um, so the top tag is a satellite tag that actually, um, when that tag gets above the water, it communicates um, to a satellite and sends a position back to us. So that's a really great way of allowing us to track these sharks almost in real time whenever that dorsal fin gets above the water. The bottom tag the, in, the, in that bottom circle is actually recording a lot of information that the shark um, is seeing. So it's, re it's recording depth and it's recording temperature and, and it's recording light levels. And then that tag will pop off and send all that information back. And what it's done is that it's, it's allowed CAM to, to really, for the first time, track these maker sharks in three dimensions. And so I'm gonna show you some of that data. Um, and so this is, our, this is our study animal, the Atlantic shortfin mako. Um, again, a really good choice for a, if you're looking for a favorite shark tonight. Um, but what it's telling us is actually even more interesting. So if we, first of all, let's take a look at the broad brush, where are they going? And the first thing that you'll see, this is obviously covers a lot of ocean. The, the cool thing about these sharks is that they, they love summer on Cape Cod, like a lot of the people um, who, who visit Cape Cod in the summer. So every summer now for three years, um, the shark has returned to Cape Cod. And then as soon as the fall starts to hit, um, it, it, it leaves Cape Cod and then it starts making these quite amazing movements in the open ocean. And um, what's driving a lot of the research that Cam and I are interested in is, you know, what is actually driving these movements? What's happening in the physical oceanography that might be explaining some of these remarkable movements that we're, that we're seeing? And that's, you know, let's take a look at some of that data now. 
So this is a this is an animation, and it shows the movements of the sharks. The colors you can think of this is almost like a weather chart, um, and those the reds and the blues are showing basically storm systems in the ocean that are or storm systems or eddies that are moving. And you're going to see this mako. He just he goes directly for an anticyclonic warm core eddy. Um, and so the first thing we need to realize is that the open ocean is actually not homogeneous, even though it looks homogeneous from the airplane. There really is a lot going on. And in fact, these sharks are really highly attuned to the physical oceanography of that open ocean and to variability in that, um, in, in that ocean. And they're taking advantage of these features to do things that were only just beginning to learn. Um, so that's the, that data has all come from satellites to measure the surface height of the ocean to give you that weather chart um, and the thing. The, this next date plot is actually showing the diving behavior of those mako sharks and that's even more amazing. So this line is colored. So the reds uh, means that water temperature is up above 20 degrees Celsius. So that's pretty warm summer temperatures for Cape Cod. But what's, what's really interesting is how deep these sharks are diving to almost a mile deep and they're getting down into water that's four or five degrees Celsius and that's what, 34, 35 degrees Fahrenheit. It's really, really cold water. So although we think of these sharks as sort of surface, relatively warm water inhabitants, in fact, they're not, right? They're spending a good amount of their time way down in the water column. Um, and, in, and in quite cold waters. Um, and that's undoubtedly having an effect um, on what they're able to do in terms of their physiology. They need to regulate heat in, in some ways um, that will allow them to make these kinds of dives. So what we want to get to after this then is uh, I'm going to show something that actually combines both those, two, both those two data sets. And we're going to really, for the first time, we're going to fly you through the ocean with a mako shark. And so the top graph is showing you the position in, in X, Y coordinates. And then the bottom graph is that same sort of graph showing you the depths that these mako sharks are going. So it starts out on the shelf and not making very deep dives. But as soon as it leaves the shelf and gets into deep water, it's making dives down to 800 meters. It's hitting a warm core eddy back up into the surface again into relatively warm water, skipping around the edge of that warm core eddy. Uh, but again, diving to over a thousand meters in that time, so way down in the water column, um, hitting another area of, of warm water in that warm core eddy. So really, this is allowing us to, to visualize in a new way how these sharks are actually interacting with their environments in the, in the middle of the open ocean where we, where we simply couldn't find them, even if we, were, even if we spent a lot of time um, and effort and, and people have. So these data really are give, uh, you know, giving us a, a unique insight into how these sharks are interacting with their environment. And this, the interesting thing for us is a reason I'll get to in a second um, is that um, this use of sharks of deep water actually turns out to be relatively common. In fact, um, as Greg will tell you, al almost everything that we've tagged has gone deeper than we thought. And by deeper, I mean certainly below 200 meters, which is the sort of the end of the epipelagic or the surface waters, and into the mesopelagic or the ocean twilight zone. Um, and so, mega sharks are, getting a mat, are spending a good amount of time out there, but honestly, so are white sharks, so are devil rays, so are swordfish, so are big eye tuna. There's a lot of different species that are actually making use of all that deep water habitat that you can see this mako um, utilizing. And, and that has been really interesting because it's, it's led us to a, a new project at HUI, um, a, 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 a big uh, philanthropic um, project. Um, this is actually Hardy Sasek talking in Vancouver on the main stage at, at TED a couple of years ago, describing a project that's now been funded by the Audacious Project um, through TED to look at the ocean twilight zone and to try and study the ocean twilight zone while it is still relatively unimpacted by human efforts. Um, and that's actually Cam again, and that's actually that same data that, you, that you've just been seeing up on, the, up on the TED screen. It's a really good TED talk if you want to go and I would encourage you to go and see it. Um, so anyway, it's an audacious project. It's this ocean twilight zone. And um, it, it, it sort of combines two, uh, two different things. One is that we have known for a while that there, are, that there is a lot of biomass in the deep ocean. This is a, a high-tech um, fish finder or echo sounder. 
and all those red, um, those really red uh, marks are showing um, uh, backscatter. Um, that indicates that there's, you know, there's something scattering. Pro pro could easily be a fish swim bladder. It, it could be a squid. It could be any n number of different things. But there's a lot of biomass down there, so it makes total sense for for top predators like mako sharks to be diving into that biomass. But um, what we're doing um, is actually trying to trying to come up with ways of visualizing, um, getting better estimates of how much is down there. We're doing some really cool acoustics that um, uh, Andoni Lavery at the Oceanographic is developing. She's putting really high-tech acoustic packages on a towed sled that she can lower into the water um, and actually now use these acoustics to not only see bright red blobs where there are, there are a bunch of um, organisms, but as you can see in this graph, this plot, you can actually see individual organisms. And so um, the team is now hoping to be able to get a much better estimate of this biomass because this acoustics is allowing us to now visualize individual organisms, which is really important if we really want to find out not only what is down there, but how much is down there um, as well. So it's really interesting work that you'll see more of for sure um, as the project moves forward. And so um, here's just some of the examples. The, the fish down there are really weird um, and really cool. And uh, to give you an idea of how many, how much fish there might be down there, it, there's almost certainly more fish down there than the entire um, sort of world marine capture fisheries currently. So um, hundreds, but you know, thousands of um, metric tons of fish. Um, it's it's a lot, but there's also squid. There's also krill. There's all kinds of organisms down there that we're really just only beginning to understand. Um, and so when we think about it, it's really a it's a really unique um, ecosystem with a bunch of different communities, and and these communities are actually tied up, in, you know, in very distinctive ways. Right? We have tunas and swordfish that are probably um, a really Im important part of that twilight zone because they are diving down into it and feeding on it. So um, the ecosystem services that that zone is providing is, is important because it's putting food on our table. It's fish that we like to eat. Um, and the idea that we can, that there hasn't yet been exploitation, at least significant exploitation of the open, of the ocean twilight zone, gives us a really unique opportunity to get some science done before that exploitation happens so that perhaps really for the first time we can actually um, base that exploitation on really good sustainability science that's going to mean that we can still um, perhaps harvest from that from that zone but do it in a way that's in a sustainable manner that preserves the amazing ecosystem services that that part of the ocean um, provides and so um, I want to leave you with this thought and that is that I think the ocean twilight zone is actually a really good example of how there still is a wild ocean out there um, it's amazing when you think about it that we have huge predators in the ocean right next to the coast, um, right off of you know, major cities in the Northeast. Uh, we've lost all those predators pretty much from terrestrial environments in North America. They're gone, but the, a wild ocean, those, those top predators are still there. It's just that they're in trouble. Um, and so um, I think, I am not the first to say this, but I think that there is a really is a conservation imperative right now, right this, right this minute, um, and that the next 10 years really is going to determine what the future of our oceans will look like. Are we still going to be, going to be able to go and see um, apex predators in the ocean like we can now? Um, you know, my 12-year-old daughter, Phoebe, um, has never seen a whale shark, and um, I want to make sure that she can still go and see whale sharks. But... Um, we all need to make decisions now for that to happen. And it's, it's at a really, it's a really critical time. Um, so with that, I'll finish off, but um, I'm going to stay around too and we'd be happy to answer questions along with Greg. Um, hopefully there's a bunch of questions and look forward to, to hearing them soon. Hi, Min. Um, and some of those beautiful photographs you showed us of the Twilight Zone fish and jellies were actually taken by a former Hui postdoc, Paul Cager. Um, so beautiful stuff. Um, we're already getting some really great questions and I'm eager to get to those. But before we do, uh, we'd like to do one more quick poll. This one is actually about blue sharks. 
So adult blue sharks are about seven feet long and they can actually grow to as much as 12 and a half feet long. That's just under four meters. Um, but how long do you think blue sharks are when they're just pups, when they're first born? Um, so the question is how long are blue sharks when they're first born, when they're just pups? All right, and we've got some answers coming in here. Just waiting for the final tallies. And so, aha, okay. So 40% of you thought that blue shark pups would be eight inches long. And in fact, the answer is 18 inches. They're 18 inches when they're first born. All right, so we tricked you there. Okay, let's get started with your questions. Um, we've actually had several questions about the effects of reduced ship traffic and shipping on sharks. Um, have uh, Simon or Greg, have either of you seen anything yet or do you anticipate seeing anything uh, resulting from this reduced human activity that is on, on shark populations? Do you, do you anticipate any uh, changes to shark populations? Uh, well, I'll, I'll ha I'm happy to, to jump in a little bit, then maybe Simon follow up. Um, you know, when with, uh, with human activity being down, it means human boating activity is down, shipping activity, fishing activity is down. And um, might not be ideal for the economy, but it's, uh, it's probably giving s sharks and, and other animals in the ocean some breathing room for a bit. And uh, a lot of the problems we're having with shark populations worldwide is there's some targeted fishing, but it's largely bycatch in other fisheries. And so when you, when you don't have hooks in the water, you're not, you don't have the, the bycatch. And um, so, you know, there is, there is some positive aspect to this um, that I see. Yeah, I would just add that uh, what, what's actually interesting about sharks like, you know, like white sharks and like makers is that um, they're actually, um, you know, they're more like whales in some way, right? They, they're actually produced young perhaps once every two years and only a few young at a time. So um, they really haven't got the ability to, for their population numbers to respond to an event that's been going on for two months, you know that's that, that's a that's a bridge too far for them. It, it what it's what makes sharks, you know, sharks like that particularly susceptible to industrial scale fishing is that they they're simply not going to be able to respond in a population sense um, to those to to such a short term event. Um, if that event you know continues, then that that will be a different story. You know the. I think there is an interesting question is, you know, what is happening in the ocean with, when all of a sudden you take a lot of people out? Um, it's, you know, it's, I don't think we're going to learn that. We don't know that yet, but it would be certainly an interesting question for people to look at. All right. And we actually have a question from uh, Simon's home country, New Zealand. Uh, some years ago, the figure of 100 million sharks killed annually came up. Um, is that number still... Uh, correct or has it changed and what is the state of protection for sharks if it is if it is changing so um, the, the, that's that estimate was made and there was you know there's obviously a lot of error that could potentially be in that number so you know people have suggested 80 million um, I think a hundred million was, was pretty high but it, it's an estimate I think the the other way to look at it is that I'm not sure that it matters whether it's 100 million or whether it's 50 million. <laughs> um, the sharks simply can't sustain that kind of industrial fishing. If they're, they're, their biology simply can't sustain it. So uh, personally, I wouldn't get too hung up on what exactly that number is. It's a, it's a really big number. Um, and uh, I've seen a little bit of suggestion that perhaps that number is trending down a little bit, but in, in all honesty, it's it's still it's still um, way more than than shark populations can can sustain. So um, um, I, I think that's the I, I wouldn't get too hung up on what exactly that number is. It, it's a it's a huge number, and it and it's an unsustainable number in my opinion. But Greg Greg may have other ideas. 
No, I, I agree with with Simon 100. You can't get hung up on that that number. There's a lot of there's a lot of error um, in these kinds of estimates, but it, suffice it to say, it, these are big numbers. And um, you know, when it comes to sustainability of short populations, Simon hit it right on the head. You know, the, these animals cannot uh, withstand a lot of fishing pressure. Um, and you know, pe that particular question asks what kind of conservation measures are in place. And you know, here in the United States, we've we've made great strides forward. Um, in protecting shark populations. And we've seen some respond. Uh, some are responding more slowly than others, but we are seeing some responses. Uh, other countries uh, may be lagging. You know, there are undeveloped countries that have unregulated fisheries. Um, and then there are some cheaters out there. So we really need to get together with countries and discuss sharks and put them on the table uh, in order to achieve uh, long term sustainability. But the problem is, um, Far too many are being killed on a global scale, and uh, and that needs to that needs to stop. All right, um, and that question was from Willifred, by the way, from New Zealand, and we have another question uh, this time from. Uh, <laughs> awesome, that was Simon's mom asking a question. No, okay. it wasn't. I'm oh, joking. Okay. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, we have another question uh, from Meredith. Wondering how much time scientists get to spend out on the water studying sharks compared to back in the lab and um, just sort of following on to that question. Several people have asked how they can become shark biologists. Uh, what's the best path in school, that kind of thing. Well, I, I mean, I, I'll tackle it first and, and uh, then Simon uh, follow up. I think that uh, sometimes people get the mis uh, misconception that we're uh, out on the water having a, a wonderful uh, time every day, you know, tagging sharks and diving with sharks and, and doing all these great things. And we do that. Um, what people tend not to see is the analytical side and the lab side. And that is uh, at least half the year, if not more cases, more, more so. You know, there's grant writing, there's papers writing, there's uh, mentoring students. And, you know, I love that aspect of it. I absolutely do. Um, but be prepared for that because that involves uh, a lot of work in your office or in the lab that you don't anticipate um, because you think you see you see me on TV and you go, gee, I want that guy's job. You know, I, I wanted Matt Hooper's job, but I didn't see what he did when, when he went back to Woods Hole. Um, and I love that aspect of it, but be prepared. And, uh, and if you want to study sharks or any animal for that matter, you got to chase your dream like we did, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and just put your nose to the, the grindstone and, and study hard and do well in school and uh, and volunteer and and do the things you need to do and to make yourself stand out as a as a young scientist trying to get into the field. Any other advice, Simon? What, what he said. He's he's actually a shark biologist, so he's, he should be giving <laughs> the advice. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. We have a question from Carolyn. How do you figure out the age of a living shark? That's a great question. Yeah, that's a that's a tough question actually because um, there re it's really hard to to get the age of a living shark, Carolyn. That's the, the problem. Is that how how we um, how we found out that white sharks could live to at least seventy years was actually we we examined the the backbone, the vertebra, and so we sectioned them. Um, and um, there's there's a lot to it, but the but the bottom line is that there are bands in the vertebra that are like tree rings, um, and we were able to show that in in parts of the vertebra they that these bands were laid down like tree rings every year, and so we could count the bands of the of these vertebra um, and estimate the age of the of the shark from that uh, as you would do for tree rings, um, and that's where we got the. The estimate. Um, the important thing to note is that I'm sure we didn't. We didn't luckily get the oldest white shark there is out there. Um, th that wasn't the one that, that we got. So I think we came out for a, a little over 70 years. But it would seem to me that there are almost certainly white sharks that are older than that out in the in the North Atlantic as well. But yeah, it's um, you know, we section, we cut the vertebra in half, and then we count these bands, and that that count gives us an estimate of the of the the age of the sharks and years. That's neat. I didn't know that about the vertebra. How cool. Um, all right. 
Theodore asks, do all sharks dive as deep as the Mako and what's the record holder for the deepest known dive? <laughs> yeah, uh, not all the sharks do, but, but as Simon mentioned um, in his talk, and, and it's really fascinating, but the more, more, the more we put these uh, satellite pop-up satellite tags on sharks, the more we realize that they have this, this oceanic component to their uh, the natural history where they move out into deep water and make really deep dives in excess of a thousand meters. And that is, you know, surprised many of us. And it wasn't really until this new te technology came out that we realized it. Now, not all sharks do that. Remember, there's over 500 species of sharks. Some occur only in very, very deep water. Others uh, visit deep water like the mako, the white shark, even the basking shark goes down to over a thousand meters and um, as do swordfish and, uh, and other species. But there are coastal sharks that very rarely if ever go off our continental shelf and they stay, you know, relatively shallow, meaning less than 100 meters. I think the whale, right. the whale shark um, is, um, is that they've been down to at least 1900 meters, I think, Greg, that's about the, I'm just trying to think, that's about the deepest one that I can, that I can remember. So. You know that's that's over a mile down, and it's it's a long way. It's, it's dark and cold down there, and we're not exactly sure what they're doing, but they go. Neat. All right, here's a question from Joshua: Is there any specific reason why white sharks aren't successful in aquariums? Well, you know, the, there's one aquarium that's done a really good job at keeping small white sharks in captivity. That's the that's the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And it wasn't until, and I want to say recently, even though it was about a decade or so ago, um, previous attempts to keep white sharks in captivity failed miserably. You need a really big tank because this is an oceanic fish, okay? And, and it's not used to being in tight quarters. Um, even in the white sharks that we see, you know, prowling the very shallows of, of Cape Cod, yet you can tell they get a bit uncomfortable if they get into tight, tight spaces where they might be within a sandbar system or near a shoal or into shallow water and they'll quickly move out. Um, and so if a shark can't handle these kinds of tight spaces, they're not gonna do well in captivity. So white sharks and, and other oceanic sharks like blue sharks, um, makos, they just, don't, they just don't do well unless you have a massive aquarium. Makes sense. All right, here we have a question from Logan who's 10 years old. He would like to know whether blue sharks swim in groups and maybe just to expand on that a, li a little bit, um, are most sharks solitary or, or do they swim in groups? Go ahead, Mr. Oh. Yeah, go ahead, great. <laughs> well, yeah, we can both comment on that. Yeah, generally sharks are solitary. There's very few that, that actually swim in groups, coordinated groups, shoals or schools. Um, some of the exceptions might be the scalloped hammerhead shark, the spiny dogfish, which is a smaller shark species. You know, blue sharks, you'll see aggregations of sharks, like for example, a, a whale carcass floating at the surface creates an aggregation of blue sharks. And, and, I, and, a, and a friend of mine once studied a, a, a floating dead whale and, and there was well over 500 sharks on it, but that's only because they all showed up at this really great restaurant. Um, Otherwise, you know, for the most part, many, many species are, 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 are solitary. They may be in the same general area because the feeding is, is good, um, but they're not necessarily associating with each other. At some point, they do socialize, uh, but not in any kind of formal shoaling or schooling. Simon, did you want to add anything or? No, that's exactly. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's really interesting as to, as to why that is and uh, what exactly has driven that evolutionarily, um, but um, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. Brady, age 10, also has a question for Greg. Greg, have you ever tagged a Megamouth? Um, they are very rare. Uh, no, I, I've tagged a lot of different shark species, but I've never tagged a Megamouth. I've only seen one and it was in a museum. So um, I'm going to leave that for you to do, but I, I, I don't know if I'll ever get that chance, but they are incredibly rare. And what's really remarkable about the Megamouth is it wasn't a species that was discovered until the, in, into the 1970s. And that's really recent to discover a, a really big fish. 
so for you young scientists out there, there's lots of room to not only discover new species, but to tag all kinds of animals and study them. All right, Brady, there's a challenge for you. Uh, we have a question from Megan, who would like to know, how do sharks sense prey hundreds of meters deeper in the water column? Um, so I think she's referring to maybe some of what you were talking about, Simon, with the sharks diving into the twilight zone. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, they certainly have got, you know, great sense of smell there. It's dark down there, so vision may not play a, a huge role. Um, they, they can detect magnetic anomalies and that's potentially possible as, you know, if you have a big um, school of, if there's a lot of biomass down there and a lot of water going across gills, you actually generate electric currents as well that the sharks could be potentially detecting. They're very good at detecting electric currents. So I think they're probably using a, a bunch of different um, sensory abilities. Um, but, but why exactly they pick certain parts of the ocean to then dive down to 1400 meters like that Mako was doing, uh, we just don't understand that yet. Um, there, it does appear that there are certain parts of the ocean like those warm core eddies that, that species like Mako's favor. Blue sharks really seem to favor um, those warm core eddies as well. And, and that, that sort of plays into one of the reasons is that the those warm core eddies actually are drawing warm water down into the ocean twilight zone and blue sharks tend to like water that's warmer than about 12 to 13 degrees Celsius. So um, they're actually using these, these eddies to, as a tunnel to get down into that biomass that you can see in that echo sounding. Um, and we're, we're, we're hopefully going to be learning a lot more about that um, in, this, in this project. Um, but it's a, it's a really great question. And perhaps they, perhaps they can't detect it at that point. And they're using um, uh, physical oceanographic structures to actually give them a clue that there is biomass down there. And, and maybe they don't actually find out if they're right until they, they get much closer. Okay. Um, we have a question from Chasio. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, who is 11 years old. Um, is there a shark that is a prey to other animals? In other words, is, does anything eat sharks? Yeah, well, you know, there's um, everything living in the ocean is a potential prey item. You know, it's a, it's a tough world out there. And so, you know, remember, not all sharks are born at 10 feet long. You know, they, they're born at... The, you know, blue shark, as we learned, relatively small sizes. And, and when they're born, they are vulnerable. They're vulnerable to not only uh, bigger fish, but those bigger fish include other shark species. You know, I, I once, uh, uh, someone I know caught a, an 860 pound mako shark fishing off Nantucket Island, and he, he, was, uh, he brought it in to eat and uh, asked me over and I, I visited him and, and in the shark's stomach was a six and a half foot blue shark. And so it's, it's a tough world out there. You've got to be careful of anything that might be bigger than you because you may be a tough guy um, to things smaller than you, but at some point you're, you're a prey item. I think my, one of my favorites is um, a photo that a friend sent me from French Polynesia, and it's a big, um, great hammerhead um, with a six foot gray reef shark in its mouth just swimming at this photographer and the first time i saw it i, I honestly didn't quite understand what i was seeing because you just see this literally this great hammerhead swimming along with the head and the tail of this gray reef shark out of its mouth right? wow so yes they, 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 they do sharks eat sharks um, <laughs> that's incredible all right uh we have a question for Simon from Atlas, who is six, why are Mako's your favorite shark? Uh, Atlas, yeah. Uh, so they are big. They're they're really fast. That you thought sort of they're so streamlined, but that you know, blue sharks are very streamlined. Um, uh, but Mako, yes, Mako's Mako. are um, and and those teeth, that eye that just kind of looks like he's. <laughs> You know, he, he means business. That's a, that's a kind of shark that you, you don't want to meet on a, yeah, late at night. <laughs> uh, they're, just, they're just my favorite. They're just really great sharks. Um, and also uh, another six-year-old, this time uh, Charlotte, 
what do shark pups like to eat? That's a really good question. It, it is. It's a, it's a great it's a great question. And you know, it, Simon and I keep saying these are great questions because we largely in the scientific community that largely doesn't have good answers for, for many of them, which means a lot of fertile territory for new scientists out there. Um, so the way we find out what sharks eat, you know, the simplest way, of course, is to look in their stomachs. And, and it's really tough to find, you know, newborn sharks. It, it really is. And, um, and so, you know, it, it's not the, we know a little bit about a handful of shark species. They eat the just smaller versions of prey that they're adults, that the adults eat. Um, and sometimes sharks go through these very distinct phases and diet shifts where a young shark might eat one thing but as it gets the shark gets bigger like the white shark like the mako shark it's it's more capable of killing bigger prey and they go through this this shift in diet and and, and that's not unusual in the shark world not all sharks do it and and some sharks are very very selective feeders and others are uh, more broad spectrum and feed on a, a wide variety of things but uh, you know, finding out what pups eat is really tough because it's not always easy to find the pup. But I imagine they're not out there eating seals, right? They're they're probably eating smaller fish and and things like that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, we we did a study in St. John on on newborn um, black tip and lemon sharks, and they were feeding in the in the in the grass and in the around coral reefs and, and picking up crabs and a variety of invertebrates as well as small fish which really abound in these, in these near shore areas of the Caribbean. All right. Um, from Joan, we have a question. What is the biggest benefit for us to maintain the shark population? So wh why should we care about sharks? Why should we care about maintaining their populations? Well, well it's a good, it's a, yeah, the, um, in some sense, that's a philosophical question, but let's start with the things that we can measure. Uh, and so the thing is, is that, um, you know, sharks in many systems are, are apex predators um, and they, you know, they maintain a, a, a balance in, in nature that um, is typically sustainable and it typically doesn't allow any, any particular level in a, in a trophic web um, to get overabundant. Um, and so, um, they are in some sense preserving um, the, the structure of those, the food webs that the sharks live in. And so if you release pressure from seals, um, seals can rebound in, in, in big numbers. And, and so um, I'm not saying that there are, you know, that you could argue whether there are, um, that we've reached that point yet, but um, I, th I think that um, there is something to this idea of a balance in nature and apex predators are really important components. If you, if you lose that top down pressure, then often things that you don't want to happen um, do happen and you end up with, you know, sea lions taking over your, your harbors, right. Or whatever, whatever it might be. So I, I think it's, it's that, that's certainly, that's certainly part of it. Um, and then I think the, you know, the philosophical question is, you know, do we want to maintain some, some parts of the world where we still have um, the kind of communities, the kind of wild animal communities that, that we had before huge, um, before this big impact that humans have made on the planet. Um, and, um, and my answer to that would be, yeah, I think it is, it is important that we maintain some of those habitats and some of those communities. And that, that and that includes apex predators like sharks. Greg, how do you feel about that? No, I think, I think Simon's spot on. And, and there's certainly been a number of models that have been developed that show that when you remove, you know, apex predators, top predators from a system, you, you create an imbalance. Um, and and it, in, some, in, some, in some cases, it can even lead to ecosystem collapse. Um, I'll just go back to the example I, I, I used earlier. You know, people are seeing more and more seals on Cape Cod and in New, throughout New England. And now the white shark is coming back in bigger numbers because we've conserved them as well. And, and they're going to do their job. And their job is to keep the seal population in balance. So, you know, I, I know there are people on the Cape who are concerned about the, the growing presence of seals and sharks. And uh, my argument would be this is a natural ecosystem. We got to let the sharks do their job. Okay. Uh, here's an interesting question from JR. Is there a freshwater shark? Uh, well, no, there's not, a, there's not a shark that's 
strictly lives in fresh water. Um, but there are sharks that visit fresh water. And I think the most famous one is, is the bull shark. You know, the bull shark, I, I once tagged bull sharks in the Mississippi and, um, and they were in the Mississippi water. river. Yeah. Mississippi river. Huh. And, um, it was, a, it was many years ago, but I, I was totally amazed when we were setting these nets and catching these bull sharks and putting tags in them. And you, you tend not to think about, uh, you know, sharks being in fresh water, but the bull and its some of its close relatives um, do penetrate fresh water and uh, have the capacity to, to adjust their internal chemistry to do that. And that's really hard for a saltwater fish to do. Yeah, that's not something I would have expected. Sharks in the Mississippi, but okay. Um, here's another question. Ren, age eight, asks, why is there so much negative media about sharks? Why are people so afraid of them? Ren, I, I, I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> um, that, you know, I guess bad, maybe bad news sells and, and so, um, you know, the, the, the crazy thing is, is that there are what I think, there were five fatal shark encounters in 2019 in the whole world. <laughs> so there every year, very a vanishingly small number of people are actually killed by sharks in, in the world. And so, um, you know, I said recently, you know, hippos kill way more people um, than, than sharks do. So um, for, for some reason, the, the people that are killed by sharks, that, that, that tends to be news in ways that, that other animals don't. So I, I'm, I honestly, I honestly don't, I'm not sure why that is, but, um, but, but it's certainly there. And, and um, I, know, I hope there are people tuning in today who maybe have that fear. And, and if we can convince them just a little bit that, um, that sharks really, we don't really need to fear them, that, um, um, that, they're, that they're really cool in their own way. I, I think that that would be great because, um, because it, it's, it, that's the re reality is that they're, um, they're actually incredibly safe, <laughs> as, as crazy as that sounds in the scheme of things. Your movie Jaws probably didn't help, Greg. <laughs> well, favorite you know, movie. I, I think I think just over the course of our evolution as humans, we have this this innate fear of that which can potentially hurt us, and it's how we survived. And and Hollywood and and other media tap into that primal fear, and we're drawn to it to some extent. And uh, and and Simon said it: sharks sell. You know, they sell well, Partic particularly you know. Sharks that are caught up in tornadoes and, and sharks that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that hop out of the water and eat people and catch fire and do all those kinds of things. And, and so, you know, people watch those, those things. Um, but, but, you know, Simon's right. You know, education, uh, you know, is what we need. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't let those movies get to me. I find them entertaining. And, uh, you know, we move on. And, and for those of us who can, we figure out what the truth is and we, we go with it. Fair enough. All right. And this is a question for both of you. Uh, why did you decide to study sharks? What got you interested besides Jaws? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, uh, you know I, I love the ocean and I love studying all kinds of fish. And I've had aquariums since I was a little kid. So I'm, I am a shark enthusiast. I love studying sharks because they're really amazing creatures in my mind. But, I, I, you know, I, lo I love studying all aspects of the ocean. But, you know, to me, you know, I probably never grew out of that, that childhood, you know, feeling that sharks are really cool things, you know, really cool fish. And they really are. And the, the more I learn about them, the more questions I have. Um, and, uh, and that's what's really cool about it. There's so much we just don't know about them. We didn't know that the, the mako went down to, a, you know, over a thousand meters deep or the white shark does that or they go out to the middle of the Atlantic. We just didn't know those things. And, 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 th and now we're learning them. So I'm you know, I'm just passionate about it. I, I, I can't stop, uh, my, you know, loving these animals and, and wanting to work with them. The, the funny thing for me is that I actually had not studied sharks until Greg came to me with a problem <laughs> um, that he was looking to solve with um, tracking the movements of basking sharks. Um, so he's totally responsible. Any, any, any shark research <laughs> I've done is totally, is totally Greg's fault. <laughs> okay. Um, 
All right, uh, that seems like a good place to stop. And uh, unfortunately, that's kind of all the questions we have time for tonight. But as I said earlier, we will still try to get answers to as many as we can. I'm told we got over 450 questions tonight. So obviously we won't get to all of them, but we'll do our best. Um, before anyone signs off though, if you're interested in finding out a little more about Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, stick with us for a few more minutes. We've got a short film that will introduce you to some of our other scientists and engineers and the fascinating work that they're doing. Uh, first though, one final poll, and actually this is more that we want to hear from you and get your input. What topic would you be most interested in hearing about in a future Hui Ocean Encounters event? And we've got some choices listed. Um, if your favorite isn't on the list, please feel free to contact Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution directly on Facebook or Twitter. Um, and we'd love to hear from you and get your ideas. Uh, whoops, I'm told we don't have a poll. So, okay, so in that case, um, please do get in touch on, on Facebook and Twitter and let us know what uh, topics you'd like to hear about in the future. Um, before we show our short film, I do want to say a really big thank you to Greg Skomel and Simon Thorold for sharing your amazing experiences with us. It has been a remarkable and inspiring evening, and we look forward to hearing more about your work with sharks in the future. And to everyone who joined us, thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation. Please tune in again next week, Wednesday, May 20th at 7.30 p.m. for our next event, Extreme Ocean Machines Exploring Impossible Places. We'll have a very special guest host, renowned filmmaker and ocean explorer James Cameron will be here. And we'll also have a panel of experts from Ocean X, BBC Blue Planet 2, and Hui. Also, please save the date for our May 27th Ocean Encounters event on the future of the ocean. The speakers for that uh, will have a very special guest, aquanaut and ocean explorer Fabien Cousteau. He's the grandson of Jacques Cousteau. He'll be here with us. And also Hui president and director Mark Abbott will join us. Thank you again to everyone and enjoy our short film. The oceans, the atmosphere, the interior of the earth, life, everything is connected. We are all linked in our research by our passion for the ocean. Hui is an amazing place, full of extraordinary people who are truly curious about the ocean, want to understand how it works. How it interacts with the rest of the planetary systems, how humans influence it. The physics, the geology, the chemistry, the biology, the interaction with human society, it's all connected. What Hui does is it brings all those scientists together. The world's best talent in ocean sciences. We learn from each other, we develop opportunities together. It's a force multiplier. It feels like 130,000 scientists. I can pull together a team from either my department or other departments at Hui to really tackle any problem. Having all the support is what makes Hui unique and enables me to do good science. Hui is at the cutting edge of that mix between science and engineering, and it allows us to ask questions that most other places can't ask. You can come up with ideas, put them into action, and actually deliver results all in a short time frame. Vehicle technology, AUV technology, seafloor instrumentation, sensor development. You get the world-class reputation, but you've also got amazing ships and engineering that allow you access to places that most other scientists can't get to. You can see further, you can go further, you can reduce your risk, and you can do it less expensively. It's really amazing for me to be able to walk out of my lab, cross the street, and get on to the research vessel that can take me anywhere around the world. I've been to remote reefs in the Maldives and the Micronesia. I've dived on both the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the East Pacific Rise, and very few people have actually been down there and seen that. We looked at these turbulent storms in the ocean and how they create upwellings and nutrients. We're able to collect samples and see how these systems change in real time. Just imagine you are diving, you are reaching the bottom of the sea mount. All of a sudden you see a cloud. As we get closer, we see these objects that were aggregated like in a mass, and you say, what is that? The sense of isolation, you can almost feel the ocean closing over your head as you submerge. You can learn a tremendous amount just by being in the environment. 
some things have struck me in the middle of the night. It clicks and you're like, oh my gosh, this is something really huge. It's that aspect of discovery, finding out something new, something that's never been seen before, creates an incredible drive within Huey scientists, engineers, and technicians. It's such a compelling place to be so dynamic and so many opportunities that it attracts really smart and dedicated students and young scientists. I was reading those papers about amazing science that was coming out of Hui. Now that I'm here, I get to actually interact with the people who wrote those papers. The positive feedback and the collaboration finally made me decide, oh, I want to be a scientist. Oh, I can be a scientist. It's incumbent on us to perpetuate the cycle of education and research and discovery. People all over the world need to recognize the role that the ocean plays in their daily life, even if they don't live near the coast. It affects weather, it affects food resources, it affects climate. The tides are changing, the temperature is changing, the salinity is changing. Climate change and overfishing are the biggest threats to coral reefs right now. How will the ocean respond to global warming? We have to understand our planet in order to be good stewards of it. We need to get the understanding into the hands of everyone from the general public to people responsible for making policy decisions. It's probably more important now than it ever was. We're very eager to provide answers for those critical questions that we must address now, and we have the tools and the means to provide these answers. This is the best place on the planet to do the sorts of things that we're doing institutions around the world look to Hui as a leader in pushing the envelope. Concepts that were developed here are understood as the basis for oceanography all over the world. I'm proud to be from Hui. There's no place on earth I'd rather be. We have the potential to change the world. It's not just about this planet, it's about life in the broadest possible terms. <laughs>